With regard to other data in concerning both ET and PV, really there was a lot of discussion at this meeting about interferons. Um, so firstly, there were the primary results from the MPDRC 111 study, which looked at uh, pegylated interferon alpha 2A, i.e. Pegasus, in patients who are refractory or resistant to hydroxyurea, showing that it was effective and well tolerated. And then concerning the other formulation of pegylated interferon, ROPEG interferon, there was an update from the PROUD PV study showing a further two years of analysis, again providing data that effectively this drug is equivalent to hydroxyurea, but enriching our knowledge about the performance of those drugs in the long term for patients. So some interesting but subtle differences with regard, for example, to jack allele burden perhaps being a little bit lower in the interferon arm but still important to note that thrombotic events occurred at a low level on both arms. So in actuality for patients, demonstrating that both agents continue to be effective. Also in ET and PV, there was some interesting data with regard to the Nuttlin antagonist uh, agent presented by John Mascarenas from the Sinai group, indicating a potential novel aspect of therapy for patients with these diseases. Considering myelofibrosis, um, most of the data in this meeting didn't uh, shed new light on the JAK inhibitors, but there was an important piece of data with regard to fedratinib, which was the second uh, JAK inhibitor that completed phase three studies, but was halted in development due to several patients uh, experiencing Wernicke's encephalopathy. A forensic analysis of those cases of uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy actually suggested that there was only one case in over 877 patients treated with fedratinib and that's led to that drug being lifted from a clinical hold. This is really important because we continue to need agents for patients with myelofibrosis who are not tolerating or progressing on ruxolitinib therapy. Otherwise, there was not much news in terms of JAK inhibitors, but there was a lot of data with regard to other agents and other potential targets for myelofibrosis that are of great interest. Importantly, anemia remains an unmet need in this setting, and there was a further update with regard to the active in receptor ligand traps, uh, Cetatacept, which is in a study in the MD Anderson showing ongoing utility to be taken forward in a clinical trial but uh, with Luspatacept rather than Cetatacept, these are very closely related compounds. And then some really interesting data with regard to other agents. For example, the SMAC mimetic LCL161, showing some really uh, novel and important uh, activity for patients. So no major big stories with regard to that. Lastly, um, there's been a big focus this ash upon um, prognostic criteria and newer prognostic criteria, both for myelofibrosis. The Italian collaborative with the Mayo Clinic presented a new prognostic score, MIP70, for transplant eligible patients, which is really important because that's where we often are trying to determine prognosis. And then the collaborative group from Tony Green, other centres in the UK, Florence again, presented um, an online tool for looking at prognosis across all of the MPNs, inputting um, more than 20 different data sets and able to produce an individualised predictor for patients. So I think that will enable us to more precisely predict prognosis, but also to think about how we stratify and target treatments in the future. When patients with um, MPN develop um, accelerated phase characterised by increasing number of blasts or frank leukaemia, we know this is very difficult uh, to treat. So there has been a focus at this ASH upon dissecting the molecular events uh, surrounding transformation so that we could understand what targets we might need to address. There have been several um, pieces of data with regard to that and also some updated data with regard to different therapeutics as well as outcomes for patients. So unfortunately outcomes for patients remain very poor, even the patients that we take down an in intensive chemotherapy induction and with an aim to transplantation. We can cure patients using that strategy but it's very few patients. 
Alternatively, several pieces of data from the MD Anderson, from the Mount Sinai group and indeed from our own group in the UK supports the benefit of combining ruxolitinib with a hypomethylating agent, generally azacitidine but also some data with docitabine for this group of patients and some emerging data showing importantly firstly that this is a well tolerated regime but also that it may well be effective in maintaining quality of life and perhaps prolonging survival for patients.